Well, I would also like to welcome our next keynote presenter, um, Elizabeth K. Wine, the founder of Music Export Memphis, and she's going to tell you a lot more about that. Um, she's also a PhD candidate from the School of Urban Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Memphis, and she is studying working class musicians in cities. So please welcome Elizabeth K. Wine. Hello. Um, also my first time in Alaska, so super excited to be here. I went dog sledding yesterday. It was fantastic. Um, yes, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to apologize for how quickly I'm about to talk and all the information I'm going to give you because um, just w welcome to my brain for the next 20 minutes. And um, what I want to do is start kind of big picture and, and a little bit of sort of the theory of change and the ethos of how I got to the place where I am and how I built Music Export Memphis and the work that we do and why. Um, so we're gonna start big uh, with some like big picture theoretical stuff, we're gonna narrow in and then I will get into the nitty gritty of what we do and, and what the impact has been. And I'm gonna take this off. Maybe, there we go. Okay, so um, I talk and think a lot in my work about the middle, um, and that takes shape in a few different ways, but we're gonna start with a music middle class. What the heck is a music middle class and why do our cities need one? So um, it's not just middle class in the way that we typically think about that phrase, right? In terms of your earning and where you sit in uh, the socioeconomic space. Um, I tend to think about musicians in cities um, in a few different categories. There's sort of 10%, let's call it, that I call hub city seekers. These are folks who were always gonna move. They were always gonna leave. And I wanna be clear that I'm talking about anywhere that's not an industry hub city, that's not New York, LA, Miami, Atlanta, Nashville. Um, so 10% of folks, they were always gonna leave. Um, let's say 30% of folks are, I call them hobbyists and side hustlers, AKA never move. Movers. They're not going anywhere, but they're also not trying to make a living playing music. They're very happy to be making music as one small piece of their life. We love them. That's great. Um, and sorry, my fonts are crazy, so things look a little weird. But uh, the 60% in the middle is who I'm concerned about. That's who I wake up every day thinking about the music middle, right? Um, and they also tend to be the music middle class as well. But those are the folks who drive everything that I do and what I've built um, with Music Export Memphis. When a city has a thriving music middle class, uh, everyone stands to benefit. Um, we see benefits in tourism, in education, economic vitality, cultural you know, preservation and placemaking, social cohesion, live music brings us together, right? It builds community, it helps us get to know our neighbors, it makes places feel safer. There is an incredible body of academic literature and scholarship that proves all of these things. We don't need to spend a lot of time proving um, that music makes these impacts in our communities. Uh, the, the work is out there that, that has been done. Um, so these, this idea of a music middle, the music middle class, and those impacts that musicians have on cities is really what sort of undergirds our theory of change as an organization, as Music Export Memphis. So this is our mission statement. We create opportunities for and subsidize working musicians in cities uh, so that they can go out into the world and build audiences outside the city and sustain their careers. Now, this is the theory of change. So essentially for those who are not in the nonprofit world and nonprofit speak, what that means is it's essentially a big version of, uh, a, of a vision statement, right? So if we do our job well, what is true is blank, right? How we make change um, and what that looks like. And so we say if we support our musicians in creating opportunities for them to go outside the city, we subsidize their career, we help them to build audiences in other places, um, what happens in Memphis is that Memphis is a city of choice for musicians and that a few things are true when that's true. That we have more vibrancy, that we have better music engagement and education for our young people, that our city's character is preserved, and very importantly, this last one, that Memphis is nationally competitive for talent. Um, we've built a lot of our uh, funding opportunities off of the impact that a vibrant creative community can have on talent attraction. Um, also on tours, but there are a lot of folks, when we think about that economic impact, a lot of what Reed was talking about, being able to speak to the decision makers in a language that not only they understand, but that they like, um, that they get excited about. 
the economic impact is one piece of it, but helping them to understand that um, music is one of the things that's going to make people want to move to your city uh, and bring talent to your city, that's big. Um, so continuing with our theory of change, right? How do we create economic vibrancy? We invest in artists, which leads them to invest in small businesses that power the music ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. We raise the creative ceiling of the music ecosystem by offering artists pathways to build networks out the sides of the city and opportunities for international exchange. This is a big one. I'll pause here for just a second because when I started the work that became Music Export Memphis, I did like an informal survey, um, truly just through my personal Facebook page, like six or seven years ago, asking folks uh, to tag an artist who'd left our city. And I asked them four questions. When did you leave? Where did you go? Why did you leave? And what would it take for you to come back? And what I thought I would hear, because what we were really starting to hone in on with the development of Music Export Memphis was opportunity. This word, I'll say it a lot, that we need opportunity for artists here. I thought they would say there weren't opportunities for me. And they did say that. But a lot of people said, I reached a creative ceiling in Memphis. And so I had to go somewhere else to sort of find more creative opportunity. And that really surprised me because we have an unbelievable community of incredible incredibly talented musicians. And I sort of thought, well, that's enough, right? There's just a ton of talented people here, so therefore iron sharpens iron and those creative opportunities will be there. But it's not that simple. And so a lot of what we do and think about now with Music Export Memphis is how what we are accomplishing by getting these artists outside the city is actually raising the creative ceiling for everyone by connecting and, and building pathways. Um, so, okay, so why export, right? Um, this first one feels really important to me. Uh, one city or market alone is not enough to sustain an artist's career, period, end of story. I, that's true here, that's true in Memphis, that's true in New Orleans, that's true in any other city. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to physically tour, though certainly that is the path that, that is most prevalent, but you're gonna make money from people streaming or downloading or buying your music outside of your city. You're gonna make money from people buying your merch outside of your city or you're gonna place something in film or television. You're going to make money outside of your market if you're going to make a living as a musician. You have to build audiences elsewhere um, and that's true everywhere else. And, and these things are sort of, you know, this again, why export is sort of, as I was building Music Export Memphis, what are these things that are driving this decision to focus on this? Um, this fundamental belief in the power of music and culture to attract talent, and of course, the unique value proposition benefiting artists and cities. Hello, hello, it's not going. Oh, there it goes, cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, essentially what I really believed when I started Music Export Memphis in 2015 was that there was a real opportunity that we were missing. My, I'm a recovered publicist, as I like to say. I ran my own PR agency for about 10 years and I worked primarily with Americana and Roots music artists based in Memphis, so some outside the city. I was traveling a lot to festivals, conferences, et cetera, and I saw a real opportunity that Memphis was missing out on. I saw some cities showing up and not doing it very well. And I also saw that there was a space for us to support our artists in getting to these festivals and that they would be the ambassadors that we needed um, to sort of drive home the message that Memphis is a contemporary music city. So I just saw a lot of opportunity um, that we had, again, music heritage, we had a vibrant music scene, we had all of this stuff, but we needed to take an innovative approach that created real value for our artists. Um, that part feels really important. The phrase I use most often is meaningful value um, because there are a lot of times where we can do something with artists that we say creates value like, oh, come and showcase at South by Southwest. Here's this stage for you to showcase. We're creating this opportunity for you. But is it meaningful? Um, what's actually happening for them? Who's in the audience? Are they getting in front of someone who's actually going to be able to drive their career forward? Is it media? Is it industry? You know, are they building fans? But we're we're doing something that may be benefiting the city, um, but it's not necessarily benefiting the artists in a meaningful way. So that's a, a real key, right? This innovative approach that says we have the heritage, we have the contemporary scene, we have artists who are touring. So how do we create opportunities for them that are really meaningful. Um, 
and this really just sort of, you know, underscores kind of what I was talking about, that we, that what I saw was that we had these artists who were touring. We also had artists who were leaving the city um, and they were leaving because they needed to find opportunity somewhere else. Sorry, I combined a lot of different PowerPoints to make this. So I apologize. There's some repetition in here. But so what you, what you end up coming up with is... Music Export Memphis. Um, the first organization that I went to when I started uh, MEM in 2015 was actually our Chamber of Commerce because I really felt like if I could get, again, stop me if you've heard this before, the economic folks on our side, um, that we would be able to make a case for supporting the work more broadly. And sure enough, they did uh, buy in very quickly. They understood um, you know, what I wanted to do. And so uh, we brought the chamber to the table. We brought tourism to the table early on and started building um, very slowly this organization that now sort of sees our role um, you know, in, in two ways, right? supporting and strengthening our artists locally, and then promoting and sending them out into the world. We kind of sit right in the middle of that Venn diagram. Um, and we do it through three programs now. And uh, and I'll, I'll pause and take a brief step back to just say that we, as I said, started the work in 2015. We were sort of slowly growing, doing a showcase, you know, here and growing it to another showcase the next year, launching our, our artist granting program, and then COVID hit. And we were still a relatively small organization. Um, in 2019, our annual, our revenue for that year was $68,000. In 2020, our revenue was $376,000 because we were tapped to run an artist emergency relief fund. Um, we were already set up to grant to individuals. We had the trust and the relationships within our music community. And some of our larger arts funders said, We've got to get this money out the door. Okay, Music Export Memphis, you're the one that's going to help to, you know, facilitate this granting to individuals. And it changed everything for us. Um, obviously, our revenue quadrupled, but also our individual donor base quadrupled overnight as well. And we spent the last now almost four years um, working to sort of keep those folks in the fold and to build in a way that is sustainable on what was really, really catalytic growth for us uh, in 2020 and 2021. And I'll get to some of the actual, the sort of numbers of how much money we sent out the door here in a second as well. But these are our three programs now. Experiences, ambassadors, and the export bank. So experiences is the first thing we ever did, which is the way I define it now is anything where we as an organization are going outside the city and we're producing an event. Um, oh, Siri. Yeah, Siri can hear me. Um, we're, go we're going outside the city and we're producing an event that is trying to create a holistic Memphis experience and we're putting music at the center. So we go to Folk Alliance International every year and bring um, Memphis artists. We, we are going back to South by Southwest this year for the first time. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we go to Americana Fest in Nashville every year. We're going to North by Northeast for the second year in Toronto. So we're, we're building showcases and parties and events at these festivals that feature these Memphis artists. Under the experiences heading, we also create cultural exchanges. Um, the biggest one we ever did was with Liverpool. We did that in 2017. Um, it was a songwriting exchange that was really cool, sort of uh, placed these artists in historic spaces in both cities to co-write. And then we did uh, public performances at the close of both of those, as the sort of the time in, in Liverpool and in Memphis. And we're building more of those in 2024. So that's all the experiences. Ambassadors is now all of our individual grant making. So this was program started in 2018 as tour grants. That is still the, the biggest um, amount of money that goes out the door in our individual grants is tour grants. It's really straightforward. I felt really strongly that musicians were already going on the road around the world every night saying, we're so-and-so and we're from Memphis, Tennessee, because they would be absolutely insane not to. Um, apologies to everyone, but Memphis is the coolest city on the planet. And if you did not say, if you're from Memphis and you didn't say you were from Memphis, you were just nuts, right? They were all already doing this. Um, and they were proud of their connection to our city. So they were already representing and promoting where they were from. We just needed to really empower them and mobilize them and also make it possible for them to tour more effectively and more efficiently to do it more, to do it better, and to really know that their city had their back. So that's where our tour support 
started. Um, so the ambassador program initially was tour grants, and we still do them. If you have five or more tour dates confirmed outside the city, you can apply for a grant from us fi between $500 and $2,500. There's a $5,000 annual cap, um, but you can apply multiple times. So if you do sort of, you know, a spring, a summer, and a fall tour, you can get funding from us for all of them. And uh, and you have sort of some like requirements that you have to complete. You've got to do some social posting. There's some hashtags we ask you to use. You sign a grant agreement with us, but it's also very simple. We also believe really fundamentally that artists are not grant writers and we don't have an expectation that they are or should be. And so our application, our, the sort of rules for entry are very straightforward. Um, the application is very simple. You know, we've said we want to support you as a touring artist. So just give us your tour information and let's go from there and we'll get the dollars in your pocket. Um, and so through the years, we've now built onto the ambassador program to have several different individual granting lines. The one potentially that I'm maybe most proud of is called our merch fund. Uh, so we provide micro grants to Memphis artists to create physical merchandise and as long as they do it with a Memphis-based business. So if you are pressing t-shirts, you can come to us, you submit your invoice, you submit like a mock-up of what you're gonna create. Um, and we also ask artists to tell us a little bit about what the return is going to be. So, hey, here are my t-shirts. Um, they're going to cost like eight seventy five dollars each to make. I'm planning to sell them for $20. Here's how many I've got. Like, um, this is what I'm thinking about the total return on investment for me. And we provide a grant up to 50% of the cost of that merchandise that we pay directly to the provider. And we've got receipts, which I'll show you in a second, on how much money that has kept in our local ecosystem. Um, and we know that a lot of these artists are spending with local businesses and they would have spent online because they tell us, right? They're like, I would have just ordered this from whateverprint.com, but you said you were going to give me money. So now I'm, I'm buying local. So we also know these are new dollars that are coming into our city and that are staying in our city. Um, and it impacts an artist's bottom line. Um, so, you know, when I don't have to tell you all, right. When you're gigging and when you're touring, who knows what you're going to make per gig? Who knows if it's going to be a guarantee, if it's going to be a door deal, what that's going to look like. But you have some control over what happens at that merch table to an extent, right? And you have control with, with this support. You can have even more control over sort of your costs and how, again, how you can, uh, you know, impact that bottom line through these grants. So we have several different other in, um, individual grants that live in ambassadors, but then our third program is called the Export Bank. This really grew the last couple of years out of uh, what I was recognizing that there were artists who had opportunities that were coming their way. This just sort of didn't slot into these other two buckets, but they were amazing opportunities that they could not take advantage of without some help. So perfect example, this artist right here is a phenomenal talent named Taliba Safia. You absolutely should should look her up and listen to all of her music. She has an incredible record coming out this year called Black Magic. Um, Taliba uh, got an invitation through some connections that she had made to go to Los Angeles and be in the songwriter's room for an HBO show called Rap Shit, which is under Issa Rae's produc production company. Um, and she called me and she said, I got this opportunity. I can't afford to go to Los Angeles, um, but I need to afford to go to Los Angeles. And we said, cool. We will pay for your plane ticket and uh, get you an Airbnb. And she went, and now she has placed three songs in the show, been invited to another writer's room, and has created relationships that will result in intellectual property money, right? That she got she got paid um, as part of that songwriter's camp, but she's also going to get paid, hopefully, for a really long time off of what she did um, in that in that space and she wouldn't have been able to do it without our support. So that's really what the export bank is about is just us being able to say yes to these opportunities that artists have um, that don't kind of fit into anything else. So, uh, so what are some of our results? 240,000 plus. This was fun because I updated this just the other day with our end of 2023 numbers. So these are all a lot bigger than they used to be. It's very exciting. This is how much we've awarded an ambassador grant since the launch of the program in July of 2018. So that's, that's everything that is the tour grants, the merch fund, and we have industry scholarships that we give out as well. We have a new program called Ambassador Access as of 2021 that creates pipelines to touring for uh, black and brown artists and women identifying artists um, to try to uh, make up for the fact that 
the vast majority of our ambassador grant recipients in 2019 were, as I always say, my board laughs at me, white dudes noodling on guitars. And so um, we needed to compensate for that. No offense to any white dude who noodles on a guitar. I'm married to a white dude. He's great. Um, but yeah, we we wanted, <laughs> we wanted to, to try to make up for that because that does not look or sound like the city of Memphis. So we're, we're building some programs that can do that. So 240 grand out the door. Also keep in mind, those programs were largely largely shuttered between 2020 and 2022. So that's really, um, you know, kind of two and a half years of true activity for some of those grants. Um, 77,000 plus, that is the n amount that our Merch Fund recipients spent with Memphis-based businesses just last year. Uh, and that is the amount they've spent with Memphis-based businesses since the launch of the Merch Fund in 2021. And those numbers really talk. And it's super simple. Again, we literally just we have the invoices, you know, we just track it. It's like, we know what we're going to give you for this grant. And we also know what you're spending with this business. Um, and we add it up and we can really talk about, uh, you know, an impact that, that is happening that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, this is the amount that we paid out to musicians through our COVID relief grants between 2020 and 2022. Um, almost, you know, well, over $450,000, uh, and this, I think this is maybe my last slide. Um, maybe, yeah. So this is a this is a big one, and I'll I'll kind of end here. And as Reed said, I'm going to be around the rest of the day. I'm here for office hours tomorrow. I'd love to talk to you more about any of our work, but especially this after our COVID, uh, our big COVID relief. Um, first round, we sort of saw some things that we couldn't unsee because we had asked artists to write down in the application exactly how many gigs had been canceled and how much money they had lost from those gigs. And some things that we knew anecdotally just came to light in a way that was on paper, um, which is that most of our musicians were being paid about $100 uh, a person a gig. And those were people who were making the entirety of their living from music. And it was really distressing. And so our advocacy work, our ongoing advocacy, advocacy work grew out of that. And one of the big wins that we have had is that we have instituted our own minimum per musician per gig rate, which is $250. And we now have partners, multiple partners coming on board in the city to commit to better employment practices, essentially, and to fair pay for musicians. And the work continues this year. My goal um, and what we've started on is working on an artist-friendly venue certification. So uh, this advocacy piece has has started to, to really grow in the last couple of years. But getting our downtown Memphis Commission, so uh, who activates spaces across downtown throughout the year and pays musicians to commit to increase to what we said was a, you know, a, a better minimum. I mean, we should all be also be doing better than 250, but when we were doing a hundred, um, this is a pretty significant leap. So now uh, we do have a lot of focus on this advocacy piece in Memphis and just trying to improve conditions for um, Memphis artists. And I know that I'm out of time, so I'm not going to talk about this, but our artists represent our city every day. Um, and they do it really well and we track it. I'd love to talk to you more about it. So thank you all so much for having me. Uh, and I, yeah, look forward to speaking to each of you. Hey, get ready to stretch. We are about to take a lunch break right after I tell you one or two quick things with my other slides. Um, uh, First of all, we are, today is the sit and learn stuff. Um, tomorrow is the, we actually get to talk about it stuff. Um, tomorrow that's happening um, at, in, at UAA, um, in the student union, the den, which is the really gorgeous new room, newer room of the student union. If you haven't been there in a while, you should go, it's beautiful. The UAA Department of Music, UAA Department of Music is partnering with us to let us use this space. Uh, Mari Han, we have huge thanks for her and for Grant for that. Um, and uh, we're hosting a bunch of UAA students tomorrow too as a result, and probably some today. But um, being in that space, we're gonna do something called office hours. Um, hey John, could I get my, there we go, yes, that's it. I've made a slide and everything. Um, office hours, um, what that means is we've got a couple of subject matter sort of experts at the table. Um, the list of names is staggering, but also we know there's a lot of other subject matter experts who could easily talk just as authoritatively about the same thing. Um, we're simply gathering in a space where you can find a person and talk to them about what you want to talk about, whether it's music, Memphis Music Export, whether it's more Recording Academy in New Orleans, whether it's all of our Alaskan experts we're going to hear in the second half telling us about what's going on here, as well as folks, I mean... <laughs> I won't tell you the list. Look at the list. It's on our website. It's great. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you know that's going on tomorrow. 
Um, I also have some homework for you over lunch. It's very easy homework. Um, we are now collating over lunch the biggest list we can. Here in the room and on Zoom, we want to know on a post-it or in post-it length language, what have you tried that worked? What have you seen that worked? What was that technique, the way you figured out how to teach that technique to your students that worked for them finally? What is um, the thing you did at a gig that doubled the take in the tick jar? What is the way you collaborated with another group to make something happen or did a cross-disciplinary exercise? What was the open mic where you figured out how it locked in? What worked for you? What would you tell another musician just starting out or struggling? How would you encourage them? Um, we like to complain when we get together. I know this because I've had 700 conversations that include the word taproot every time I come back to Anchorage and talk to other musicians. Um, and that's fine. That's valid. We need those discussions. We need to share our collective grief over this or that or this or that missed opportunity. Um, but I've had a lot of those discussions, and right now what I want to know is what worked for you. So, we got a ton of post-its out there. We got markers. Um, we've got some places to put the post-its. I want you to do that during lunch. And if you're not a post it person or you don't want to fight through the crowd of the pizza, uh, go ahead and go to the site. Um, that is going to be a place you can do it. Just fill in a simple form. If you're on the Zoom, fill it in. We're going to collate some of the answers and look at them after lunch. And we're also going to send every single answer to you guys in the follow-up email next week. Um, that is your homework. Um, if you can't think of anything nice to say, um, I want you to know that we think that is valid and valuable. And my, come on, clicker, there we go. One more slide. You can do it, baby. Come on. John, could you hook me up there? Thanks. Just one more slide. Yes. Okay, there we go. We also have a well of despair, also known as a trash can. If you really need to get it out of your system, please do. That is valid as heck. And then throw it in the well of despair and write a song about it. Um, uh, you can also go to typeintothevoid.com. It's shockingly therapeutic. Um, we'll have those discussions about the problems on another day. But for now, I want to hear from you guys over lunch what works. We're going to read out some of those answers after um, we collate them over lunch. But for now, we have pizza. We have um, many other foods. Thank you so much to Moose's Tooth for giving us a whole bunch of free pizza. And thank you to our volunteers who are trying to keep them hot, even though we had to get them a little bit ago. So if your pizza is still warm, thank our incredible volunteer crew. Um, we're going to watch some videos and take a break for lunch.